the Caribbean, azure seas, beaches, reggae, slave revolts, cruise ships, holidays, fictional murders and low-flying airliners. Few parts of the world have such a big density of different countries and territories as the Caribbean, but how did that come to be? Well, it all started out with a certain Christopher Columbus who claimed the entire New World for Spain. Some of that changed through the Treaty of Tordesillas, when Portugal managed to wrangle itself into a slice of the New World pie, but the Caribbean wasn't affected. For the most part, however, Spain's claims were just that. Claims. Initially, the Spanish invested in Hispaniola, but they quickly moved on to Cuba, before forgetting about the Caribbean altogether and starting to look for shiny, shiny gold on the American mainland. Traditional wisdom would have it that this left the Caribbean nearly devoid of human habitation. But the few Spaniards who remained on Hispaniola founded a little town called Santo Domingo, making the current capital of the Dominican Republic the oldest European settlement in the Americas that still exists. There was, however, a darker note. When Columbus first landed on Hispaniola in 1492, an estimated half a million Taino people lived on the island. By 1517, this figure was just 14,000. European plagues and Spanish attempts to enslave the locals were mostly to blame. The 16th century was a quiet one for the Caribbean. The indigenous population of most islands had all but disappeared, the Spanish were more bothered with mainland South America, and other European powers favoured the spice-rich East Indies over the West Indies. Tons upon tons of silver were shipped through the Caribbean to Europe, however, and that attracted pirates, privateers, buccaneers, and other naval ne'er-do-wells to this part of the world. Actually, ne'er-do-wells is a highly inaccurate way to describe these early pirates, as most of them were simply trying to steal Spanish silver on behalf of the English and French crowns. The most famous of these was Sir Francis Drake, who captured a year's worth of Spanish silver in a raid on Panama. Come the 17th century, things were about to change. Pirates were going nowhere, but they were no longer alone. The 1620 saw English, Dutch and French privateer harvests turn into full-fledged crown colonies. Between 1620 and 1650, Britain took St. Christopher's, Barbados, Nevis, Antigua, Montserrat and Anguilla. The French also arrived on St. Christopher's, shared in the island with England, but they also took Tortuga, Guadeloupe, Martinique, St. Lucia, St. Martin, which they shared with the Dutch who had established the colony there earlier, St. Bartholomew's, Grenada and St. Croix. Between these English and French conquests, nearly all of the Eastern Caribbean had been taken from the Spanish. This was not all for Spain, however. As mentioned, the Dutch settled St. Martin early on, but it didn't stop there. While still fighting their war of independence against the Spanish on the better lands of Europe, the Dutch colonised Sabre, St Eustatius, Aruba, Bonaire and Curaçao, Tortola and Anagada. None of this was good news for Spain's hopes of holding on to the Caribbean, but those hopes were definitely shattered in 1655, when Admiral William Penn conquered Jamaica, making it the first major Caribbean island to be colonised by a European power other than Spain. Meanwhile, French pirates had settled on the western half of Hispaniola in the early 1600s, causing the Spanish settlers to withdraw eastward. France capitalised on this in 1665, when the colony of San Dominique was established. As the 18th century dawned, France had taken Dominica, St Vincent and Tobago. The newly unified Kingdom of Great Britain owned the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas and the St Andrew and Providence Islands. The Danes had come for what was left of the Virgin Islands, and with these European powers not being able to avoid fighting each other, Britain had taken Tortola and Anagada from the Dutch, Spain had kicked the Dutch off of St Eustatius and the British and French off of St Christopher's, though both of these islands were almost immediately reconquered. This left Spain with just Cuba, the eastern half of Hispaniola, Puerto Rico and Trinidad, as well as the Pearl Islands off the Venezuelan coast. That was the history of the Caribbean, and as a result, Caribbean culture today is famously a mixture of Spanish, Dutch, French, British and Danish cultures with nothing else really mixed in there. Yeah, it isn't. We can't really put this off any longer, we're going to have to talk about the transatlantic slave trade. This complex of trade links probably deserves a video of its own, but the essence of it is that vast numbers of Africans were forcibly moved to the Caribbean to work on plantations. African slaves had first been brought to the Caribbean as early as 1503, and they would continue to be forced across the Atlantic until 1807 in large numbers, with slave imports to the Caribbean not ceasing until 1848. Slaves in the Caribbean were generally treated appallingly, and it should come as no surprise that they started to revolt. The first slave revolt occurred against Spain in the 1510s, but the famous one occurred in San Dominique and led to the establishment of the Caribbean's first independent country, Haiti. San Dominique had been the largest and most populous French Caribbean colony, and when the French Revolution broke out in the homeland, that left the colony in disarray. The Haitian Revolution saw more machetes than guillotines, but led to its own reign of terror in which the European settlers, bound slaves and freed slaves were constantly at odds with each other. 
the Haitian Revolution inspired slave revolt in Jamaica, known as the Second Maroon War, in Grenada, in Curaçao, and in the British Virgin Islands. But all of these revolts were put down. During this time, Europe was embroiled in the French Revolutionary Wars, in the course of which Spain ceded their part of Hispaniola to France, who were still nominally in control of Haiti. The next decade of Hispaniola history can only be described as a clusterfuck, and France, Haiti, and Spanish settlers all claimed the island. Haiti eventually won, and let's just say their actions in the aftermath created tensions that separate Haitians and Dominicans to this day. During the Napoleonic Wars that followed, France lost nearly all its Caribbean colonies. Most of them went to Britain, which also got Trinidad from Spain, but interestingly Sweden of all countries occupied French Guadeloupe from 1813 to 1815. If all the violence and slavery left you thoroughly depressed up to this point, let's rejoice at the arrival of the 19th century. The 19th century saw relative peace in the Caribbean, as well as slow but steady abolition of slavery. We cannot talk about the 19th century, however, without acknowledging something else that happened a few decades earlier. A dispute of whether Earl Grey was an acceptable flavouring for Boston Harbour led to the establishment of a thing called the United States. This new country would play a big role in the last three great territorial changes to occur in the Caribbean. In 1865, it settled the Hispaniola issue once and for all by supporting the Dominican Republic and forcing a weakened Spain out of Eastern Hispaniola. By 1895, it went one step further and declared war on Spain, taking Cuba and Puerto Rico for its own. Finally, in 1917, it threw money at Denmark to take over the Danish Virgin Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, it's decolonization time, and it's bad news for the Earl Grey enthusiasts as the newly independent Cuba favours Marx over Monroe and falls willingly under the influence of the Soviet Union. And with that, we've moved from pirates to slave revolts to missile crises, which are too petty and depressing for me to discuss. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe to Robert Explains, and if you hated it, feel equally free to spew vitriol at your leisure. Until next time.